Being a geologically active world, Earth has had its times of immense change throughout its 4.5 billion year history, which in turn directly affected the evolution of life, with some adapting to said changes, while others fail to do so. That being said, Earth has also went through more stagnant times, and by far the most infamous case of this was a large span of time in the Proterozoic Eon, known as the Boring Billion. Spanning from 1.8 to 0.8 billion years ago, this long era consists of the Satherian period from the Paleoproterozoic era, the entire Mesoproterozoic era, and most of the Tonian period from the Neoproterozoic era. For this video, we'll mostly look at the Mesoproterozoic, spanning from 1.6 to 1 billion years ago, and which is divided into three time periods, the Chalmedian, Ectasian, and Stenian. Unlike the last installment where I went over each time period individually, for this video, I'll instead just go over the notable events that occurred, both geologically and biologically. So let's begin our dive at what Earth was like during its so-called boring billion, and see if maybe there's more to this era than meets the eye. If one were to travel to Earth during the Mesoproterozoic, they would be met with a very unpleasant world. Oxygen levels would have been much lower than they are today, and the majority of the oceans would have lacked it entirely. As a result, the oceans would have been a black slash murky turquoise color and were rich in hydrogen sulfide, which is the gas that gives rotten eggs their putrid smell. As you can probably guess by that statement, the oceans wouldn't have smelled the best. The land wasn't really any more noteworthy. While tectonic activity heavily slowed down during this time, the continents were still moving nonetheless. The large supercontinent Columbia, which formed in the era prior, finally broke up by about halfway through the Mesoproterozoic, and towards the end of the era, a new supercontinent, Rodinia, would have taken its place. I'll probably go more into Rodinia in the next installment. So Earth continued on with low oxygen levels and low geologic activity for the next billion years. Geologically speaking, that may seem dull and boring, but biologically speaking, this is exactly the conditions that life, more specifically the eukaryotes, needed in order to start experimenting with new forms, some of which were really important in the evolution of life. And by far one of the most notable achievements was sex. I'll explain. One of the core aspects that makes life, life, is reproduction, of which there are two types, asexual and sexual. Asexual reproduction is pretty straightforward, involving a single parent of which produces genetically identical offspring. This method is used by all prokaryotes in addition to a few eukaryotes. Asexual reproduction can work just fine. Practically all life had done it this way for billions of years up to this point, and billions still reproduce this way today. Yet this method of reproduction has a very notable flaw. If a species reproduces asexually, that means every individual will have nearly the exact same set of genes, meaning there will be a lack of genetic diversity. So if a major change happened in the environment, then the entire population could be at risk. That's where the benefit of sexual reproduction comes in. Sexual reproduction, unlike the method mentioned earlier, involves two parents, where, via meiosis, produces gambit cells, of which each contain half the amount of chromosomes per parent, and are ultimately fused to form the offspring. This method of reproduction results in offspring with more genetic diversity, and with more genetic diversity means a higher chance of survival. So, for organisms that reproduce sexually, if a major change to the environment were to occur, then the population can adapt better and thus have a better chance of survival. With Earth being in relative stasis, eukaryotes had plenty of time to experiment and evolve, and the introduction of sexual reproduction only aided in accelerating their evolution. It was around this time when the major eukaryotic groups officially began to diverge from each other, though the differences are only subtle for now. The first group to branch off probably would have been the plant lineage, more scientifically referred to as Archeoplastia. While specific dates vary, it's generally agreed upon that at least three major subgroups of Archeoplastia would have emerged by the end of the Mesoproterozoic. Red algae, green algae, which also includes land plants, and glycophyta, sometimes called grey algae. In addition to plants, the major group Amorphia would have also branched out around this time. Today, this group includes amoebas, in addition to ophisticans, which includes animals and fungi. Back to the plants for a moment, algae was pretty significant for the evolution of complex life for several reasons. For example, Bangiomorpha, a genus of red algae, was the first known organism to have reproduced sexually, of which I already discussed earlier in the video. Additionally, many species of algae from this time have clear evidence of being multicellular, which was a big game changer. 
Multicellarity can have huge benefits. Having multiple cells work together means certain ones can specialize for a specific task, and in addition, the organism would be capable of becoming much, much larger, appearing as titans compared to its single-celled brethren. Multicellarity is considered one of the most important innovations in the history of life on Earth, as it ultimately paved the way for the vast and diverse ecosystems that exist today. So that concludes the so-called boring billion. I didn't really go too in-depth, but I try my best to find anything noteworthy about this era. Things will start to get more interesting in the next installment of Paleo Journey, where history begins to repeat itself. I hope you enjoyed this short video, and I'll see you next time.